crappy spring weather in Chicago. Although, I have to say, I sort of love the spring. I love the slow spring in Chicago, too. Um, so I'm really pleased to be here. I want to thank everybody at Intuit for inviting me to give this talk tonight. And um, so I'm just going to jump right into it. I wanted to say I have some cards over there. Uh, there I actually have another book that I've worked on. Uh, pretty much all the things that I've worked on I've done collaboratively. Um, and so one of these collaborative projects is a card for over there. It's called Flaunted, Queers Organizing for Public Education and Justice. So that's another one. Um, so great, um, I'm going to jump in. And I wanted to get start off with a little caveat, uh, not an apology, but a caveat that this is not the queer history, obviously, but rather it's a queer and idiosyncratic history in and around Chicago that I'm going to be uh, offering you today. And although Joel doesn't like to use cheat sheets, I am going to read from my notes <laughs> because that's just kind of how I have to do it. So I, I don't. You know, obviously, I don't know anything about you all. I, I actually know that someone over here knew that this picture was from the 70s, and that's cool. And maybe we'll have time to talk about some of the our own reference points. Um, but one of the reference points I don't know if you all have in the same way that I have is why queer? Like, why, why this kind of terminology? Why this framework? So you might ask that question, and you might not, but I'm going to offer you my explanation for it. Um, so why I'm using queer tonight is even though terms are always shifting, I think we all know that the terms that are applied to ourselves, to the groups that we belong to, are always changing, they're always being contested, and that's great, that's a really exciting thing. But for me, right now, I think that queer is still linked to some ideas about love, about liberation, and about using our radical imaginations to make better futures for everyone. So that's why I'm using it. For me, it's, it, it's a big umbrella term that I think we can all find a place in. And hopefully we do find a place in it. So tonight I'm going to show you some images, and I'm going to tell you some stories about a variety of political engagements. And along the way, I'm going to also introduce you to some terms and frameworks that have been useful for me, because I am a teacher <laughs> and an academic. Um, however, I, I'm not talking to you tonight, I, I hope, and I, you know, I'm going to put this out there, from the position of an expert, uh, which I have to say um, that mode is something that I'm increasingly tired of, uh, you know, going to a talk, I'm the expert, I'm going to tell you how things really have to be. I'm really wary of that as well as tired of it. So instead, along the way tonight, I would like to invite you to feel free to interject, to offer some ideas, you know, ask me some questions if you have them, and uh, to challenge me if you have some challenging sort of viewpoints, I'd like to hear those too. So to see the possibility of a, a dialogue, which we'll have time for at the end of the evening, I'm going to close my talk with a few questions, or at least a couple questions. So in other words, there's a quiz at the end, so be ready. Um, not really. So I'm going to get us started where I got started, in California in the Bay Area. And this picture was taken in 1976, and yes, I'm wearing that gorilla suit right there. That's me dressed up to participate in a theatrical review, as we called it then, Dykes on Parade, uh, that was aimed at revealing the hidden and ignored histories of queer women. And so in this, this case, I was dressed up as a gorilla, and I don't know what kind of queer woman she was, but I also played a variety of other roles, from an Amazon to Queen Christina of Sweden. And this was really fun. I had a great time, and this was sort of my first uh, really venture into the idea that politics and parades could come together, and that we could look fabulous while also being political activists. Um, the equation of costume play, parades, and activist work was shaped by the context. The 1970s was rich with dress-up in the service of pleasure and also in the service of social movements. So for folks who aren't aware of what these images are about, I've, I've labeled them. The Coquettes were a big um, activist group, but also a, a theatrical drama group, and if anybody out there knows more than that, they can chime in. And also Sylvester, who was a Bay Area uh, person who was a musician and also uh, part of the Coquettes and many other activists and political groups of the time. Does anybody want to add anything about either of these before I flick on? All right. So we were building on lineages of similar kinds of work. Harry Hay, for me, is a great example of this, this idea that we build on lineages. In his case, um, he was building from the powerful organizing work of the Communist Party, which he was a member of in the 30s and the 40s. And, and then he left, actually I think he was forced out because he was queer and the, the Communist Party was not a um, comfortable place for him to be at home there. 
Um, and he went on to co-found new gay liberation and social justice groups, including the Mattachine Society, which some of you might have heard about, which was founded in 1950. And that was the second oldest gay group, gay rights group in the US. The oldest gay rights group was actually founded right here in Chicago, and that was called the Society for Human Rights. It was founded in 1924, so this city really has a, actually an amazing uh, queer and, and gay rights history, um, history to it. Um, and he also founded the Radical Fairies, which probably more people might be aware of, uh, which he, along with other people, started in the 1970s, the late 1970s. So from Hay's example, I take two lessons. That the first one is that organizing tools can be used across contexts and that we build on what we learn from, from each of these contexts, so we can. And Hay took what he learned, for example, from Communist Party organizing, and then he built new groups with those tools. Um, and then the second lesson is the idea of collaboration. Uh, Hay built these organizations with others. He wasn't the sole leader or the sole founder. He was a big personality, for sure, but he, he started these groups with other folks, and that was really important, doing this work with others to change the conditions of their lives. So two more examples and broad ideas have influenced how I think about activism. The first is summed up in the quote from the great civil and human rights activist Ella Baker, who worked within the civil rights movement, but she also critiqued it from the inside for its sexism, for its hierarchies, really rigid hierarchies frequently, and also for its reliance on the idea of the charismatic leader, the person out in front, usually a man, who was going to tell everybody else what to do, and they were going to follow him. She instead promoted participatory democracy, um, which was an idea that was bubbling up around that time, the idea that everybody should be included. So the way that I take up this idea is twofold. Uh, today, I try to avoid dealing with folks who present themselves as leaders who have all the answers. And I get involved in organizing where everyone is invited to play real and significant roles, and uh, where people actually get to try out new roles and, and grow into new, new kinds of positions and skills. And the second is the concept of intersectionality, or the ideas that the social and political categories that we occupy interact with each other. It, has anybody out here heard that term, intersectionality? Good, a few people have, thank you. These days, I'm telling you, <laughs> it makes me feel old using these terms, but anyway. Um, so this is really important, I think, and you can see it summed up in this quote by Audre Lorde, the, the great author. Um, that, that, that none of us are one thing only, and that, that, that oppressions or the categories that we occupy interact with each other, and we have to pay attention to all that stuff in our work. So I have a few examples to share next, and I think that all these ideas are going to show up in each of the examples. So not so long ago, these were common sites in Chicago. It was the beginning of the real estate bubble, and actually these sites I think are still pretty common in Chicago, unfortunately, even though that supposedly the bubble has burst. Uh, we're in some other kind of moment now, but it's similar looking. Property values at this time, though, in the, the sort of the late 90s were increasing, taxes were going up, uh, rents were rising, and many people were being displaced. We heard a lot of talk at that time about gentrification, which is still something that people are concerned about, but I think at that moment people were really identifying that this is a problem, people are being pushed out of neighborhoods, this is called gentrification. This city, like others, joined forces with developers to brand and market neighborhoods and communities. So here we can see how one of Chicago's historic queer neighborhoods was marked and marketed as the first so-called official gay neighborhood in the US. At the time, this was a controversial move, uh, at least to some people. There were people in Chicago who thought that's great, you know, neighborhoods should be marked like this. Um, although this, this, these pylons did not grow up as a community kind of um, response to the neighborhood. The community didn't choose this. Other people said this is, this is crazy, like, you know, who's benefiting from these kind of markers? Is it the real estate developers who are benefiting? What's going to happen to these communities when they get marked in these ways? Um, and the area, this area, had already become, at this point in time, too expensive for many of the, the gay homeowners who had lived there previously. And now uh, it was really turning into more of a bar and business, a gay bar and business owning, owning area than a real community that people were able to afford to live in. And so the, that move, as I said, was seen by, really by, as a move by some in the service more of developers and business owners, not the residents. So enter Queer to the Left, which was a group that I became involved with around this time in the 90s. A diverse group 
of queer activists working in Chicago in the late 1990s and then the early 2000s. This group came together through involvement with ACT UP, the earlier group. Um, and come on in, there's folks out there. Um, so again, building on that idea of uh, groups building on the knowledges that came before and taking organizing from one model uh, or one mode, one movement into another model or mode and movement. So we, I think, come on in, grab a seat. I think many of us are, are aware of the work of ACT UP and how powerful that work was in changing the lives of many people in response to a terrible crisis that was happening. So building on the, the lessons that were learned through that activism and kind of overlapping with it, this group, Queer to the Left, rose up. And here you see an image, Power Breakfast, um, that was created by the ACT UP Chicago Women's Caucus. So queer to the left, in contrast, or well, not so different maybe from ACT UP, but, but focusing more broadly maybe, um, emphasized pleasure, love, play, building community, uh, the ways that we needed to nurture each other, really I think in some ways as a response to the work of ACT UP, as well as the, uh, paying much more attention to, or really conscious attention to the intersections between oppressions. So we like to march in coalition with other radical groups in, gay, in, in the Gay Pride Parade here in Chicago and really paid attention to how we were able to support the work of other groups like uh, the trans groups, youth groups, uh, just many other groups. Usually we all jumped into the parade and we were not the official part of the parade, but um, groups, you know, finding a, a kind of a community together. And we were constantly trying to think of ways to interrupt what we saw as the increasing kind of homogeneity of the Gay Pride Parade and also the, the lack of political focus of the Gay Pride Parade here in Chicago, but more broadly nationally. Um, and again, the, par the parade was often being marketed as a, a piece of this neighborhood that was marked by those pylons and it was marketed to tourists and it was seen, seen to us that it was it, it frequently uh, further and further away from the things that were actually shaping the lives of of gay people in Chicago. Uh, so here I, I thought we were sort of flaunting our anti-capitalist politics. And also our opposition to state br brutality and different forms of state brutality. In addition to doing things like uh, participating in the Pride Parade, we held forums on the death penalty and um, housing issues, the idea that housing is a queer issue and that, if we, that uh, traditional issues that we're seeing as gay issues uh, in, in the same way now that we have these issues that are kind of considered the gay issues like marriage and the right to serve in the military, we're saying we're, we're not paying attention to the issues that actually impact people's lives much more significantly in some ways, housing, health care, those kinds of things. And also, of course, we participated in movements against the war, more affordable housing. And we... Um, tried to think about ways to reframe the advertising that was targeting queer communities and had targeted for quite a while, but it seemed increasingly uh, targeting queer communities by talking back to ads like these, to Absolute ads, and there are many, many others that were created by Absolute, uh, with stickers like these, which we made and <laughs> plastered around and passed out. Thank you. <laughs> Were you there? Did you have the sticker? Well, I'm not that old. Oh. Oh, it's so do I. No, I meant so <laughs> I meant so It's raining. It's raining. It's not ageism. No, that's all right. That's all right. Um, that was very cute of you. <laughs> all right. So, um, and we also uh, really uh, tried to poke fun at establishment LGBT groups like the Human Rights Campaign, which is still out there, HRC, uh, which was notorious around this time for, among other sins, uh, for refusing to advocate for trans people and for uh, donating money to uh, Alphonse D'Amato, a Republican um, legislator in New York, and for doing a number of other things that, that seem pretty heinous. So, and, and actually, uh, most of all, perhaps, uh, for their kind of uh, queer normalizing stances, that they wanted gay people to, you know, as we put here, look normal, and to look normal to be able to be funded. And so we, we tried to call attention to that. In this case, we made a puppet of the HRC guy and carried him in the Pride Parade. 
Um, and again, as I pointed out or mentioned earlier, gentrification and affordable housing were key concerns for us. And we wondered why the city seemed to be working in collusion with business owners, gay and straight, to keep the pride parade in one largely white neighborhood, which was by no means the only um, gay neighborhood in the city of Chicago, if you wanted to you know, call any neighborhood a gay neighborhood. So again, we asked, who's benefiting from this placement, and why couldn't the parade be elsewhere? And again, we, we turned back and thought of, again about marketing, who benefits from the marketing, marketing of Boys Town with what we, we saw in a, in a way as these sort of absolute bottles as pillars. So we urged parade goers to liberate the neighborhood from this kitsch by taking a piece of the pylons home with them after the parade. Nobody took us up on that. We probably couldn't use the sticker anymore. It would be, yeah, we'd be terrorists or something now. I don't know. Anyway, at the time it was funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. So a few blocks away in my own neighborhood, in the 47th Ward, similar ideas and fears were being expressed. And so now I'm kind of transitioning to another mode of activism. Um, and so th at, at the time, uh, how many people have been in Chicago through the 90s? Anybody else here th during that time period? So you might have remembered seeing around town there were a lot of these signs. People were just graffitiing up everywhere. No yuppies, yuppies go home, die yuppies, things like that. And again, it was this sort of fear of, well, uh, not just fear, but the actual pain of being displaced from neighborhoods. And people weren't quite sure where to direct it. So it got directed in this way. And the 47th Ward Alderman, the 47th Ward where I lived, which was the kind of the north center area of that um, neighborhood that's also called St. Ben's, um, that alderman, Eugene Schulter, uh, was a, he played heavy Chicago machine politics, doing things like doning out zoning changes and development approvals to uh, primarily people like real estate uh, folks and developers who made contributions to his campaign fund. And people were also acting up against him in these ways. So this is just an example of neighborhood, another form of neighborhood graffiti. Um, I had nothing to do with that, but I thought it was really interesting that, that this was another expression of this real anger about what was happening in, in the neighborhoods and who was benefiting from these changes, these really rapid changes. And Alderman Schulter, just to flip back from it, Alderman Schulter, we thought, was remarkably puppet-esque. Um, and we related him to the HRC guy, but in this case, we thought the developers were pulling his strings. So I worked with a group of neighbors to repurpose the HRC guy. We turned him into now the Alder Puppet, and we took him all over our neighborhood, photographing him in poses, gloating as low-end businesses folded and other kinds of businesses. Um, in, in the case, we kind of targeted Starbucks in this case as a, an example, as sort of a symbol of the shift from businesses that all of us could benefit from going to, like Unique Thrift and these kind of higher end places that were coming in, luxury condos, Starbucks. And pretty soon, the Alder Puppets mark was everywhere in the neighborhood, on flyers like this, and on stickers that we made and put up trying to advertise the relationship between the political forces in the neighborhood and what was going on with the, the rents, trying to make links between the, you know, who was, who was calling the shots and what was happening to the rest of us in the neighborhood. And we uh, made the Alder Puppet uh, the star attraction at a parade that we had in our neighborhood, uh, which was a, a huge parade. We pulled it together in only a week and over 300 people showed up. So it really indicated to us that this was, we were tapping into something. People were quite upset about what was going on. So we marched to the alderman's office with the puppet, the alder puppet, but the alderman slipped out the back door. He wouldn't come and talk to the puppet. That would have been a great photo op, though. <laughs> and we also did a lot of research. We looked at what the results were of the kinds of changes that were happening in the neighborhood, these rapid changes in the rents and the cost of housing. And we tried to pull together the data that seemed really hard to get and publicize it or make this, this more widely available on this website, uh, which also featured the puppet, and tried to use this as a place where we could post uh, information about changes and zoning changes and meetings that were happening where big decisions were being made that seemed to happen without anybody being able to have any input. And we also got a grant uh, through the Crossroads Fund to create this little newspaper, which was a spoof on the Alderman's real paper. His paper was called Alderman Schulter Reports, 
And so, as you can see here, we called ours Alder Puppet Shoulder Purports. In other words, he's just a big phony. And we printed this up, and we took it out to the library and distributed it, and we stuck it into the reader, and people picked it up. And I think we only printed out uh, printed up about 500 copies, but we put it, you know, in the general neighborhood. And it was popular, but the newspaper made the alderman very angry, and he sued us. So now I'm shifting into a dark part of the story. <laughs> I'm not trying to scare you all, but uh, he did sue us. First, he started by suing the Crossroads Fund, from whom we received that money, which was, again, a very small amount of money, I think $300, something like that, to make the paper. And then he shifted the suit to the three people who had actually created the website and the newspaper. So at the highest, uh, or the highest dollar amount, or the lowest point of the lawsuit for us, um, the suit was for a million dollars. Part of it was for what they called cyber piracy, and the rest of it was for libel and defamation. So, in the bigger picture, a lawsuit is not the worst thing that can result from activism. But I'm just revealing the consequences to <laughs> you all. Um, I'm sure we can all think of, of examples of things that are more truly horrible as results of activism. And, and, you know, we can probably all think of a lot of current ones. I'm thinking of Ai Weiwei as one example. And many people, you know, Bradley Manning is another example. Um, those are really horrible stories. What happened to us was not truly horrible. But being sued is actually quite scary. And it's a big time-sucking drag. It's also common. And so I'll share what my suit sisters and I learned through this experience. We learned that this was called a slap suit, and that these kinds of suits are typically directed at small-scale community organizers by politicians and by real estate developers, we found out. And so, yes, it, in, you may have this question, you know, pe people frequently say, well, it, was, it wasn't free speech, don't you have free speech? And so, yes, it was a First Amendment free speech case. But no, it didn't matter that the alderman couldn't actually win the case. He didn't sue to win the case. He sued to punish us and to make us stop carrying around a puppet of him, which we did on the advice of our lawyers. So <laughs> as soon as we were able to find some lawyers to take the case, that was the first thing they told us. You know, you can't keep doing these things. So it's very effective, these kinds of lawsuits. So did that stop us? Well, no, not completely. We all moved out of the neighborhood, and we went on to do other kinds of work. I got a job teaching art education at the School of the Art Institute where I was forever trying to organize a union, or failing that, a chapter of the American Association of Professors, which you can see the art logo for here, uh, with my colleagues at that place. And then, since I was spending a lot of time as an art educator in public schools, I also worked on that front, for example, by co-founding this group with Erica Miners, a person who I frequently collaborate with. Uh, to bring attention to the fundamentally anti-queer and misogynistic underpinnings of military schools, which Chicago has more of than any other city in the nation. So again, we were trying to make links between these issues. You know, what, what about these environments are uh, damaging to children broadly, but what about them is specifically homophobic and misogynistic? And military schools are uh, both those things. Uh, Erica and I also documented our work as queer activist academics and teacher education in this book, which I have those cards over there for, which we both saw as an attempt to shift the profession through research and documentation. And also, um, we created it as kind of an archive of the tactics that we had tried, what had worked, what hadn't worked. Specifically, we focused on uh, the school or the college, which many of you are probably um, aware of here in, in, Ch in the Chicago area, Wheaton College, which is a Christian college which also educates people to be teachers in public schools. So through our research, we found that Wheaton College, like six other schools in the Chicago area, requires its students to sign a pledge that homosexuals are condemned. And yet those are the same people then who are being prepared to be teachers in Chicago public school classrooms and public school classrooms more broadly. So that's one of the stories that we tell. We really tried to focus on that and uh, raise awareness in our profession about the damage that that can do to children in those schools and what a complicated an issue is to balance personal beliefs and religious beliefs against these kind of public goods like public education. And so anyway, we wrote about that. And so that book and the other books that we've worked on together that you heard about earlier uh, have offered us opportunities to invite groups together. And so here is an example of a, a flyer that was for our book launch party. And instead of focusing it on our work solely, we tried to invite a whole bunch of other groups to come in. 
uh, youth groups, all, all kinds of, of queer-related groups to come and talk about the activist work they were doing in the city that was broadly connected to education. Again, trying to build community and nurture each other so that we um, and build community so that we're not isolated in our work because, as you remember from my lawsuit, this work can be very, very trying and exhausting. So it's important to support each other. And Erica and I also participated in pulling this group together, for example, after the idea for it was brought to us by two young teachers who we met at that book launch party and who told us how isolated they felt in the profession as out gay teachers and how they really needed to be able to talk to other teachers about what they were experiencing. And we, along with many other education researchers in Chicago, participate in the, this group, the Chicago Land Researchers and Advocates for Transformative Education, or CREATE, which is active right now. So if you're interested in education policy is issues, or the Chicago Teachers Union, or anything like that, you can go to this website and download policy briefs that we're trying to use to counter some of the positions of the city, you know, the, the trend to shut down all those schools. So, as you can see, I have managed to find any number of places to jump in and work and I would like to invite you to join me in this work. So I, to close out, I'm just going to say, here are a few of the things, I've, I'm summed it up here, uh, the things that I've learned so far, things that have been useful to me. And these are the ideas of starting where you are. There are things to address all around you. There's probably something here tonight that we could dig into. Work with others, though. Don't do it alone, because it's a lot more fun and a lot more effective if you do this kind of work with other people. Make connections between, you know, have that intersectional lens on. Sure, it's about public education, but it is also about other things. It's about housing, it's about poverty, it's about uh, the way that we are able to support uh, diverse, diversity of genders. So it's all those issues at the same time. But have fun, seek pleasure, dress up, don't let yourself get down. I, at the same time, though, I think it's really important to show up and do the work. A lot of times, all of us probably, well, you guys are all show-uppers, you're here tonight. But there are many people who don't always show up. Uh, it's easier to stay at home, so it's good to come out and try to do the work with others. But at the same time, to take that lesson from Ella Baker, to let other people in to share the work with you, not, not to be the one who holds all the knowledge, but let other people have that role to use all the tools that you have. In, in my case, I've used art because I have art in my background. I've used flamboyant clothing because I like to dress up. But I, I'm also an academic researcher. I've, I've used research as a tool because that's something I know how to do. And you all have skills as well. Um, but leave a trail, Try, you know, give a talk, write a book, do something that other people can see, pass on that knowledge because it disappears if we don't share it with each other. Think long term, don't get discouraged because you know, things take a long time to change, so you just have to keep plugging away at it. And finally, keep moving. Don't let yourself get too, too um, stuck in one position. So that's it. That's my talk. Thank you. <laughs> I have a, a couple little questions, but if, if people want to stick around a little bit, we can talk a bit and share some ideas. I'd love to hear what drew you here tonight. Um, the question that I had, or maybe two questions, was, where have you had experiences working with others to address social or political issues? And what were the things that you did together? What was useful and effective? What did you think you'd want to continue doing? And what did you find really a drag about it? So does anybody want to chime in or just say who you are and what, what brought you here tonight? Anyone, anywhere. You in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Kyle, and I heard about it through uh, Filter Photo Festival. Um, mm -hmm. They list uh, different art events in the city. And I went to the um, the march, if you will, the uh, rally, uh, I guess it was a couple weeks ago, or a little over two oh. weeks ago, uh, the night before the, um, the DOMA uh, oh, yeah. arguments in the Supreme Court and the Prop 8. Um, yeah. And I went to support the cause, but also like, photo ops. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's Great. what drew me here. Good, thank you for coming. Anybody else who would like to say anything about what brought you here? I don't have anything to say about that, but I have a question okay. for you. Ask me a question too. You know, someone that's gone to the Giddy Pride Parade here for Chicago for over a decade and has seen it morph and change, it's getting very political. And it was interesting to hear you say you wanted to politicize it in the uh, beginning, and now it's like as somebody that just sort of wants to go and be part of the social thing. It's, yeah. You're waiting for these politicians that just show their face for the day of the parade because, well, we're 
we're supporting this, and then you know, you're like, well, where's the fun in the parade anymore? Where's yeah. I mean, I know it's parades as activism, but where is the sort of balance between? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think that's a great question, and I'd like to hear other people's perspectives. But my experience of the parade is that, or the way I thought about the parade is, when that parade first started, it it, it was just a ragtag group of people carrying signs, right, about whatever their thoughts were. So it was it was a, a a movement for liberation that grew up out of community that needed that liberation. The kind of politics I think you're talking about is I see as like a usurpation of this other earlier thing. I, who wants those politicians? Yeah. What have they done for us lately? Like, I, if Rahm Emanuel shows up this year, I, I'm going to want to throw up, I, really. So <laughs> that's just my feeling about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so, but, so I would like to see more um, groups. I want to see the school kids. I want to see, you know, all, just all the groups in the neighborhood should come out. I want the queer librarians there, and sometimes they are there, but but less of that sort of, uh, you know, the big stoley truck and more of the, the groups who have things that they'd like to communicate to each other. Anyway, that's how I feel about it. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, at the end of March, there was a you know, big demonstration against the school closings, but big demonstrations against the school closings or against many other things, also operate a lot like parades, right? It's with, with a permit, and there were, there were there was civil disobedience, capital yeah. C, capital D, and it was you know already sort of um, negotiated with the police. Right. And it was very much a photo op itself. Right. And on the one hand, there's critiques of this that like, okay, this isn't a demonstration. This is a parade, and the parade as a critique of what mm -hmm. happened, or as civil dis disobedience is something staged in a, in a performance. And I don't, I don't just. I don't know, I don't feel um, that easy with that critique on, on the one hand. Like, no, it's not as radical as maybe I wish it was. Yeah. But at some point, having that kind of legality allows for a mass participation that um, lets people not be afraid of having the kind of lawsuit that you face, right? And, or, I don't know, <laughs> it, it, yes, yeah. it does, yeah. it does, right? Yeah. You can show up to that demonstration without the fear of, of, of um, being many, that's sort of part of the idea. So I don't, I don't, this is something I don't have, have resolved, right? That parade is something anti-political, and I, I apologize, I walked in late, and I'm asking no, this question. Okay, yeah. But um, I mean, what your thoughts are on this, on this sort of yeah. problematic yeah. between, or anyone else? Yeah, let's you know, hear another quote. Yeah. Critical mass does not permit, they just do. Critical mm -hmm. mass is a group of people who ride bicycles right. once, a, once a month, mm -hmm. and they just ride through the city, and it's a, it's a mass of people riding and they ride as far as they do through the streets and the traffic just has to wait for them to pass. So there's a, and they make a conscious decision to do so. So <coughs> you have to think about what is your intention, what is your purpose, and what are your goals. Those are the things that are going to make you make a choice between permitting mm -hmm. and doing. Critical mass is successful, i.e. the police do not arrest them. Except in New York City, where they constantly oh, uh, Well, they do all over the world. Yeah. They, they, you know, they, in Sao Paulo, places like that. But, the pro but here, they don't yet. Because the power makers have made a decision not to incite a group of people who are reasonably well organized and can express their organization. That, I think, is the issue. That's one of the issues. That was the issue in the 1960s. That was the issue in the 19. 20s, when, when people were first meeting cl clandestinely to try to figure out what to do. But I have a question for you, okay. and that is, um, the, I noticed that the, the law firm that handled the case was Fioretti. It's and the same Denver. one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And did you have any dealings with him? How did he behave well? No. <laughs> <laughs> he's a big asshole. But, um, <laughs> so, I mean, I know he's you know considered like an independent alderman now, but uh, obviously this you know shaped my um, thoughts about mm -hmm. already. But I, I don't know anything about him really personally. But mm -hmm. we just thought he was he was really an asshole. He was he played a lot of those kind of um, things of you know kind of a, a, a harassment through. Mm -hmm. Uh, subpoenas, like we'd have to always show up and then he wouldn't show up, mm -hmm. you know, so we would have taken a day off work but he wouldn't be there, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So he was, he was masterly at that, mm -hmm. so. And he seemed to be the, the go-to uh, lawyer for all the politicians in Chicago at that time, so it was really interesting to me to see that he became this so-called independent alderman now, mm -hmm. whatever that means in Chicago. But um, I, I'll, I'll ask 
I'll answer your question, and I would have to say, like, I, I am by no means, I think, like, you know, as I said earlier, an expert on when to parade and when to get the permit and all that. And I do think, I agree with you, I think there are probably really st strategic ways to think about that. And I know that some of the most powerful moments that I've had, like that parade that you saw that picture of where we had the alder puppet, we didn't get a permit for that. We just took the sidewalks, and then before we knew it, more and more people joined us, and it was, they couldn't have stopped us. It was just this big group. And, I mean, 300 people isn't even a massive group. I've been in much bigger groups where, you know, you're, you're on the sidewalk and you're doing what the police tell you to do, and then all of a sudden it surges out, and you're just in the streets, and that's very exciting and powerful to be a part of. But there's probably a reason why, at the same time, you plan things, you know, strategically for a photo op, and the Chicago Teachers Union has a need for some of those things, and there's symbolic arrests and all that. I understand that as well. And a lawsuit against them would look much differently than this. Yeah. yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah, well, they're never going to get sued like that because they're just smarter than <laughs> Yeah, but yeah, so I think there's different modes for, for these things, which is why I think it's important actually to kind of document this stuff and say, you know, how did it work? How did it play out for you? Yeah. Um, other, other thoughts and questions or just curiosities about any of these images that I showed or movements that I talked about? Would you like to chime in about your comments about the, the um, image at the beginning about the hand cut flyer? <laughs> that, was, that was a good pickup on your part. Oh, it's just, you know, that's, you know, yeah. I, I came of age as an organizer in the Bay Area as well. Oh, you did? Okay. So it's just, it was, it was resonant. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're talking about pre-Photoshop, pre everything was like hand cut, paper cut, and hand drawn, and also the childcare was available at the time, which is something that you don't see quite as frequently. Well, you, you don't see that, what well, I was saying, you don't see that mixed with such a transgressive image. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, you know, in relation to, because I think that's a play off the sort of Dietrich thing with yeah, the, yeah. the suit and the gorilla. Yeah. And you don't see that mixed with child care. <laughs> um, there you go. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which yeah. was, you know, the, uh, sort of that era of lesbian feminism stayed. No, or it wasn't. Or safe in yeah. any way. I think nothing in the Bay Area was then, actually. I mean, there was a very political time. What year is that? Uh, 76. <coughs> yeah, 76. Uh, what other kinds of things are people here involved with? If you're involved with any kind of political organizing or movement stuff, what gets you motivated? What do you think are the really big issues that we should be focused on? Well, I'm, I'm here because of the idea of using art education as a means of overcoming the sort of rigid, test-bound regurgitation of facts. And oh, yeah. it, it has always been so. Um, I worked 15 years ago now with a public housing group that started its own um, art group for its children. Uh -huh. And um, my personal experience was to help them um, get tickets to Art Chicago. Uh, and they went during the weekday, during the school day. And it was very interesting to watch the children engage them with the artists and wasn't mm -hmm. so crowded and busy yeah. as those days. Uh, these are children who, whose adult world didn't extend much beyond the project. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing that I think would help education um, for people in different parts of the city to understand the different parts of the city. And I think that's something lost even by the CTU. CTU people, activists, are aware of these issues, but they don't have time to address them yeah. because they're addressing more basic issues. Right. So I was just yeah. wondering what suggestions you had. Yeah. Um, you know. Well, that, I have another talk I could have given. <laughs> it's all about social justice and art education, which I am really committed to. And I worked as an art educator at the Art Institute for like about 11 years. And now in the work that I'm doing, I'm focusing on museums and trying to use the lens of social justice or, or justice work uh, in relationship to museums. Because well, maybe somewhat like the kids you're talking about, not exactly like, but um, I grew up in a, a kind of a small working class city in California, Hayward, uh, which is like a cannery town. And 
Um, and the places that we would go visit when I was in elementary school there was a factory. Every year we would go on a field trip to a factory. So we went to Heinz Tomato Factory one year, we went to Mother's Cookie Factory another year, we went to a milk factory, and they never took us to a museum. So like in Chicago, you always hear about kids going to the Art Institute and stuff like that. I didn't really reflect on that until years later. It's like, what did I learn from that? You know, what, did, what kind of future did people see for me or the other kids at that school? Which was largely kind of a working class uh, Mexican American Portuguese uh, community there. And so I really thought about, you know, who gets to be included in these experiences with the arts and, and other kinds of culture uh, that you get through museums, and then who gets just completely left out. And you really see that in the employment in museums, who, who gets to work in those places. So anyway, I'm bringing that lens to it. But I totally agree with you. I, I think that CTU is obviously fighting for the survival of public education at all. And once they manage to get that, then they'll, they'll probably turn their eyes more to art, art education. But, you know, I think we're all going to have to focus on that because they need our help, I think, in, in that way. I mean, it's not just the CTU. It's also the, the state trends and funding and all that kind of stuff. It's just terrible. So many of the schools. I mean, actually, Chicago is better off in some places than Illinois because we still require that even kids at the elementary level have a certain amount of art. There's an art teacher that floats around. and. And at the high school level, it's still a required amount of credits that kids have to get. Some, some places, they've gotten rid of that completely, which is crazy. So, yeah. So I, anyway, that's a, a good point. And if I ever give that other talk again, I'll, I'll let you know. <laughs> Any other thoughts or comments before I release you all from the rafters there and, and let you go for the evening? Yes, did you have something up there? No? no? OK. <laughs> Well, thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you. Go out there and prosper. Yeah, walk around. <laughs>